Hello everybody, um, my name's Jamie Badminton. I'm creative director for Carrot Entertainment in London. Uh, we're an animation studio and, content and IP creator. Uh, and we created a show called Sarah and Duck that I'm here to talk to you about today. We founded the studio in 2008 and this is our first show. So we've only been on the air with the series for about a year and a half. And so far we're in 80 countries worldwide. The show's made for CBBS uh, and BBC Worldwide and it's a preschool series, so it's for under six-year-olds. I'm here to talk about the storytelling and the way that we created the original concept for the show, uh, as well as the production pipeline for it. So I thought I'd start by showing you a clip from the series. This is a uh, trailer of scenes from the first 20 episodes to give you a little taster of the show. And it's about a girl who lives with her best friend who's a duck. Enjoy. Sarah and Duck. 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 The core Adobe software we use to create it is Adobe Photoshop CC uh, to, to build all the background assets and all the character art, uh, which we then take into a bit of software called Selection. Uh, we also have Audition CC for editing the sound, so all the sound clips get prepared uh, using Audition. Premiere Pro uh, CC, we do all our editing in, and, uh, and output final picture. And we use After Effects CC for any visual polish and final comp work. Um, before we go too much into technical details, I'll start with us how the sh where the show came from. Carrots always had a goal to push TV series animation and, um, and tell stories Multiple stories with several characters. We started off the company with a children's book that I uh, illustrated and co-wrote. But it took a year to make it, and then when we published it, children read it in 50 minutes. And, and we knew that if we were going to get off the ground and tell stories over a longer period of time, we needed to build momentum behind us. So we played to our strengths. Tim O'Sullivan, who I founded the company with, was a, a fellow animation student at the Arts University at Bournemouth. And we decided to open up a studio along with Chris White, who uh, handles the business side of the organization. We all shared the dream of, of developing children's TV ideas. So when we uh, first got the chance with our first commercial job for the BBC uh, to put a team together, um, we were able to put together a team of eight. And everybody that was with us at the end of that project is still with us at Carrot six years later. Um, when that project finished, we decided uh, to focus any spare time between commercial work we were doing on developing series ideas. And um, we came up with 10 between the group of us. Um, but Sarah and Duck did rise to the top of the pack uh, through the pitching process. So as a collective, we got behind the series and put all our energy into creating a pilot and pitching it internationally. The creators of the show are two people, Sarah Gomez-Harris. She was also a graduate from the Arts University Bournemouth. And she's a writer and illustrator. She designed the show um, and coming from an animation background also knew how to think and write visually. Uh, so she, she designed all the core of the show. It was also based around her childhood love of ducks as well. Um, Tim O'Sullivan is the other co-creator. He's a fantastic storyteller as well as animator. And uh, if Sarah has personalities from Sarah, I think Duck has a few personalities from Tim as well with his sort of the way he charges into things really positively. So uh, uh, I'm going to show you a comic strip that we use to pitch the series. We um, used this to unveil the concept of the show out in Hungary uh, four years ago. Uh, Sarah Gomez-Harris drew this, uh, and this is her town growing up. Her front yard was about three children across, so not too much space to play. There wasn't much to do apart from sit on a wall, kick a football against the fence, uh, get shouted at by the neighbours. You can play in a shopping trolley, but even that wasn't that much fun. The front garden had a German cat called Klaus and a nice big tree in it, but that was about all that fit in there. The uh, front garden was overrun with bushes with bugs in. So some of Sarah's favourite childhood memories were going on the train with her parents uh, to see the ducks and visit them and feed them in the park. Um, there were such strong memories that she'd always think of them fondly growing up. One day she met Tim, fellow creative director at Carrot. They liked the same movies as each other. They liked similar sounds, like the clacking of snooker balls. Uh, Tim also had webbed feet, which was very duck-like. So um, the, the two of them got on. Sarah liked the texture of Tim's business cards when she first met him. And uh, she'd always go on about the ducks uh, that she remembered from childhood. So they, they'd go to visit the ducks as adults and revisit that and bring it back to life. She talked about it so much that Tim would often joke about, you could live in a house with a duck. You could uh, um, fly a plane, uh, watch TV together, and just hang out. 
Um, and this idea really sort of permeated uh, through conversation. So Sarah drew a sketch of her with her pet duck. This is the original drawing that it all stemmed from. And when Tim saw this, given that we were developing um, ideas, he said, this could be a show. And Sarah had never really thought about developing TV series before. But she rose the challenge, chatted it through with Tim. They imagined in their front rooms, Sarah and Doc floating across the, a flooded living room on bread slices. Sarah imagined what the title sequence would look like. Tim played the theme on his guitar. And uh, whenever Sarah was out and about, she'd listen to music on the tube and imagine them sort of stranded on the stairs or listening to some Ethiopian swing music in the park and uh, imagine them dancing on a beach at sunset. So around her 25th birthday in the studio, they put a short pilot together, showed it to myself and Chris. We loved the concept and decided to push it further forward. We developed it a little bit. We spoke to some TV executives. We actually found that they recommended a bit of symmetry within the character and maybe just a tiny bit more iconic. So from the third one to the fourth one, we made quite a few changes that just evened her out a bit and I think helped her appeal to, uh, to preschool girls especially, I think. We uh, then made a pilot in-house, sent it over to Cartoon Forum, got on the plane with them and uh, decided to go and pitch it, which was pretty nerve-wracking for our first production in a world where there were lots of established companies. So we were pretty scared on the day that we pitched it. That was us looking terrified. We also looked terrified on the monitor below that. And uh, that, actually, that slide actually got us a round of applause, which loosened us up, which was really lucky because uh, then the presentation went really well. The last slide we had was this slight joke about us feeding the hungry ducks in Hungary, and which wasn't funny. So I'm very glad that it loosened us up and we got the commission. So we got commissioned for 40 episodes. We suddenly had that challenge to uh, make those 40. And I'll show you how the pipeline has enabled us to do that, um, thanks to the help with Adobe. The show is about a girl and a duck that live in a house together. Sarah's got her iconic green hat and very wide eyes, and that sums up the outlook of the series. Wherever she goes, duck tends to follow. Um, just as enthusiastically, but very differently. You know, Duck will enjoy splashing in the puddles while Sarah shelters. Sarah loves the details in life, which I think m matches the uh, amount of detail in the show as well. She loves the uh, spines of tomatoes and looks up as well as down and keeps an open mind, which we like the philosophy of the show to be. Duck's a little bit more unrestrained. He charges into things without thinking too much. Uh, and because we follow a, a small girl wandering around the world with her pet duck, uh, the narrator and the father figure is really important to us. This is Roger Allen. He's uh, in the thick of it and uh, in V for Vendetta. Fantastic actor who gives us that fatherly reassurance that everything's going to be okay in our adventures. Here's a little clip from the show itself. This is uh, Sarah and Duck uh, waiting for some seeds to grow and getting a little bit impatient. So, what else are you doing today? Waiting. Oh? For the seeds to grow. You know it could take a while. That's OK. Oh dear, perhaps if you go to bed, it might happen faster. I think that clip sums up the gentle nature of the show, and we're really proud that parents come and tell us that that's what they like about the series. Sarah's actually voiced by a seven-year-old girl, and because uh, we record so much dialogue, we want to make sure that we get that spontaneous take. We do record quite a lot, so audition is absolutely essential as a bit of software to have help us catalogue that sort of, you know, sometimes we've got 25, 24 takes of the word kite, for example, just to get the right reading. Um, audition is awesome at making sure that we don't lose track of any of them and can reference them 50 episodes down the line as we're now doing. So I'll just give you a quick tour of Sarah and Duck's house. This is their front door. You can see here in the, um, all the artwork is created in Photoshop, as I said, and you can see the textures that we've got here. The, the texture here is actually from a, a t I think it was in Marrakesh, where Sarah took some photos of some tiles on holiday and, and layered that into the picture. And Photoshop just enables us to blend that in seamlessly. And we actually draw straight into the software using Wacom pens as well. So none of this is paper-based. That's across the entire production, actually. Go down the front path, you've got the shallots there. They greet Sarah and Duck as they come in and go out. They're actually the seeds that you were waiting for, to grow for just now. So here's their first appearance. Morning, Sarah. Morning. Hello. 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 Ahoy. Ooh. Hello. And they, they, they were born in the first episode and uh, have been in most episodes since then. Uh, they go through the front door. Uh, here's the kitchen. You can see more of that texture that we're able to bring in at every stage. Uh, they've got a high table where Sarah and Duck can sit there and swing their legs uh, and feel important in their own kitchen. 
Uh, we also have a living room. We don't have a TV in the living room. They like to sit and think here. Um, we save that for the technology room. Like a lot of people now, they watch TV through their computer as well. So we, we hope that we have a very connected show and up to date in that sense as well. So they spend a lot of time in the technology room uh, getting excited about new things. Duck's got a very messy boys' bedroom, so we, we hope the show appeals to boys as well, and we're finding that with the feedback we get, um, which is quite rare for a girl lead show. So we're actually about sort of, uh, we did a survey that was 45% boys and 55% girls, uh, and there's Sarah's uh, very girly, uh, full, of, full of her interests bedroom, but you know, ni not nice and grounded and not too pink, we hope. Okay, we had to uh, fill the, the world with other characters as well. Although we found Sarah and Duck can actually carry the show really strongly by themselves because of the strength of personalities. I guess because Sarah knows the character so well. Between three of them, uh, the, all 40 episodes for the scripting came together. So, so um, Sarah and Duck can be at the centre of all our stories, but extra characters are helping us. This is Scarf Lady. She's a knitting obsessed lady who is also a bit forgetful. So her bag is her long-suffering husband, essentially, who gets a bit disgruntled. Uh, with uh, forgetting things, but and always has to sort of remind her to pick him up when he uh, gets left behind. We've got Rainbow, who uh, Rainbow burst in through the uh, kitchen window here when they were making tea for themselves. I'll show you a quick segment of that. That is some amazing lemon water. Well, how does it taste? Good. Try some duck. That water might be a bit sour for duck. Whoops! Hello! Wow! My goodness! Hello! Ooh! <laughs> Tickly! <laughs> Alongside the other quite surprising creatures in the world is an umbrella that doesn't like the rain. We also have Workbound Moon, who they bump into on his way to work, so he's always carrying his briefcase and using elevators and lifts uh, in tall buildings to get a bit closer to the sky, so it's uh, easier for him to get up there. You might find him on the tube or on the train uh, getting to work. We actually found that halfway through the development of the series, Sarah and Duck were so strong as a partnership from the child perspective. We didn't have any older children in the series, um, or any other children at all, so the next ones we introduced, because we did need some, uh, were another bird and child combo. This is Flamingo and John. And uh, what we found with these two, we were able to create just as many eccentricities as Sarah and Duck have uh, in Flamingo and John, uh, which gave them a really good ground for comedy. We like to treat the show a bit like a sitcom. And uh, in these images here that were just again drawn straight into Photoshop uh, with the Wacom, you can sort of see how we're trying to go for the sort of boys playing together, girls playing together dynamic and, and make the show larger. Um, in the last clip before we look at some technical examples, this is uh, the first meeting of uh, Flamingo and John. Uh, so you can just get the child logic that's in the show. Sarah and Duck are trying to play doubles, but there's only two tennis doubles, but there's only two of them. So you'll see what happens. And so our players limber up. Finished. Ready now? Ready. Remember to hit the ball inside the lines or you'll give the other team a point. <laughs> oh! A great first serve. Hmm, I think we're missing something. You know, Sarah, it's quite hard to play tennis doubles when there's only two of you and you both want to be on the same team. Hmm. I could ask that girl in dark. I'm not sure that's a girl, and the dark is a bit too tall and skinny. The girl has really short hair. I think he's a boy. Oh, hello, boy. I am John, and this is Flamingo. I am Sarah, and this is Duck. Ah. Flamingo and John. Hmm. There's two of you. Yes. Ah. Do you want to play tennis doubles? OK, then. Ah. Well, I think that's our problem solved. Uh-huh. Come on. In the first series of Sarah and Duck, we made 40 episodes in the space for about 18 months when we were up to speed in production. All of that was 100% in London, which, yeah, I said we were really adamant about. And I think for our first show, even though we've been doing commercial work for, say, five years before that, we were really keen that for our first series we 
handled it as closely as we can, could do. And the software has honestly allowed us to do that. If we weren't using a combination of Adobe and Cell Action, we'd have had to have done a co-production. Co-productions can be excellent when you've had a bit of experience of making shows before, but if you're doing it for the first time, you don't know which battles to pick. And having it all in one place has allowed us to learn that process so we're open for co-productions in the future. And also know where we need to pay close attention in that pipeline. So it took uh, 16 months uh, in full production for the art team uh, to make the show. The first series was about 1.8 million pounds to make. Um, which is quite low for 40 episodes when you consider a feature film might be 50 million, 100 million pounds or more. So we have 40 stories for that price. Before we got started, um, we tested out the pipeline to make sure that there weren't any bugs in it. And I recommend that if you are going into a large project. We made three episodes with maybe half a size crew before we went onto a double team structure. Uh, we actually have two teams going at once with the production of the series. Um, that has very many benefits, actually. We're in production series two now. We, the budget has gone up a tiny bit. That's really um, to make sure we can retain the talented staff that we've trained up over the first series uh, and just to make a few adjustments in the pipeline to keep improving it. This is the essential core of the pipeline. Um, each episode is six and a half minutes. Uh, the script team, as I said, we have such cohesion within the script team because it's only three people working on all the stories. I think that gives it a singular voice. That, from there, it goes straight to storyboard where um, that takes about two weeks to create the storyboard panels for a 6.5 minute episode. That can be anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 panels depending on how much we choose to animate it to give the guide for the animators and the comedy timing. From there we've got the uh, animatic which is edited in Premiere and that takes about two weeks to assemble uh, once we've done the storyboard panels. Uh, from there that acts as a really great guide so the art director knows what they need to draw and then we spend three weeks with an art director and there's two art directors in, on, on one on each team. They produce an art pack of key locations all in Photoshop in wide shots. So we have to do them about 8,000 8, uh, sort of DPI across to make sure that we can do close-ups and zoom in. That then goes to the build team for three weeks uh, which is a mixture of cell action and Photoshop and then ten weeks for post. Um, having the two teams is really important for schedule juggling. We, uh, we have some small episodes and some big episodes. You need to respond, your pipeline needs to be flexible enough to respond to the um, needs of the storytelling. We don't want every episode to be a big event but because we, we like our small world, but some of them we want to be really huge with. Um, it's a lofty comparison, but when Chuck Jones was making all the Looney Tunes cartoons, they had five weeks per cartoon. And he'd have cartoons like the Roadrunner episodes uh, that he knew like the back of his hand that he could spend three and a half weeks on, and then did epics like What's Opera Doc that took six and a half weeks. And I guess we try within the pipeline uh, to keep a little bit of flexibility so that our simple episodes with Duck in the Kitchen being a robot in cardboard boxes uh, uh, give us the ability to make these big epic ones that have a full fairground for the full six and a half minutes. Um, so, so the two teams has really helped us and I really recommend that if you're running a large scale production. Uh, for using Audition and Premiere Pro, um, it's been so easy to use. Uh, we had an editor that was used to using Final Cut Pro come to the, the series, this series, and he, he said he knew everything that he needed to know for the show in two weeks, um, which is great. There's no there's not too much extraneous clutter in there um, that we don't need and the workspace is very clear. We're also able to uh, import and export directly from and to Audition, Photoshop and After Effects into Premiere to keep updating. Everything talks to itself, which is vital for a pipeline that you don't want breakages in. You can see how all the thumbnails being brought into the storyboard panels, so it's such a visual way of editing your storyboards. Uh, you can trim them dynamically using the JKL trimming feature. Um, and when you finish an animatic and you want to keep working, you can also use the media encoder uh, to render files while you're still using Premiere, which keeps the workflow moving. Vital when we've got only two episodes to do every three weeks. Uh, Cell Action is the animation software. We did the pilot in Flash, actually. This bit of software was developed in London for Peppa Pig, Charlie and Lola, uh, earlier shows using, using the software. It's designed to talk to Photoshop directly. So all of these handshakes are created, uh, drawn in Photoshop and built in, but bought into Cell Action and you then build a model from there. We have eight different angles of Sarah from front, three quarters, side view, back view. And uh, what we're able to do is uh, if we want to tweak maybe the color of a hat, we can update that and it uh, in Photoshop and it updates across the entire piece of software and all the scenes that we want to use it in. We have the viewing window over there um, so you can see what your final image is like. But it has a complete sort of Photoshop database there. Um, we're then able to render out PNG sequences. Here's a bit of video, sorry. Uh, we're then able to render those, that bits, those bits of animation once we finish them in Cell Action out as PNG sequences. This was a sequence where we really wanted the bike to have some 3D depth to it. Um, so we thought we'd build that in After Effects. Uh, this is the After Effects. Uh, uh, rig that we, we've got built up there. So it's a little bit 3D, the, the wheels can move in three dimensions. But you can see how seamlessly the cell action footage is integrating with the After Effects footage, even though it's on all separate layers there. And there's lots of layers to that bicycle, and you can animate those directly in After Effects. Uh, you're here seeing some of the um, painted background art that we bought in directly from Photoshop. 
um, which again, we can update at any time we want to. Um, we wanted to create a multiplane effect here. So although it looks like a flat image here, the elephant and Sarah and Duck are the only things from cell action. The rest of it, if we pull out, you can see how, um, how three-dimensional, how many layers there are in ultimately quite a simple image. But when you pull it all together, it gives that really lovely effect of depth. You see we had to make some elements a lot longer than others as they sail past the camera. Here's the final shot altogether. So it's, it's a subtle effect, but um, we've sort of had to pedal quite fast for it. Um, our editor uh, recently mentioned how there's a simile, uh, a metaphor with uh, ducks in the water, how they glide beautifully across the surface, yet they pedal, uh, paddle furiously underneath. And that's very similar to the way we make the show, really. Our goal is to make uh, all the technology disappear on the screen, so you'd never know. This is a bit of footage of Sarah and Duck uh, visiting some fish at Flamingo and John's house. We can do some effects in cell action, but occasionally when we want a little bit more magic in the shot, we jump back into After Effects, and um, we really thought that a bit of water shimmer would be really helpful here. So we uh, just take the water effect tool, which is, comes as default within After Effects, and uh, jump in. Obviously, at that scale, it would have been wrong. So we're able to change the scale of the way the sort of particles are moving um, to something that's a lot gentler, a little bit less intense, slow that down a little bit. Uh, and once we feel we've got that just right, we can take it back into our image, uh, make sure it's at the right scale for the story we're telling. And then because we've imported the artwork in, in layers, we can slot it in in exactly the right place. Alternatively, of course, you can mask off the areas that you want to, uh, uh, that you want affected by it to leave the rest of it untouched. And I think, uh, again, it's a subtle effect, but being able to have the tools at your disposal to plus things on a television schedule is just, is just, just really enhances that magic that we're really sort of striving for in everything we do in Sarah and Duck. So there's the finished shot. Um, it's, it takes quite a lot of orchestration and conducting to keep this together, but we wouldn't work in any other software, I don't think, because the smoothness uh, to get the end product is effortless. I'll just show you one quick clip uh, from the show, just so you can see all of that together again, um, including all the sounds from Audition and all of the, all of the mixing that we've done. Uh, this is uh, Sarah um, conducting the pipes in, her, uh, in the attic that have been making rather too much noise and keeping her awake. Enjoy. Hmm. Huh. <laughs> well, look at that. You're conducting the pipes, just like an orchestra. <laughs> Go on then, pipe conductor. Play us a tune. Yes. Sleepy duck. <laughs> Best take him to bed. Um, we're, we're, we're so lucky that parental response has been, has been strong to the show. We've had children say it's their first word. Um, our parents have told us that their first word has been duck, which is amazing to hear. We got nominated for a BAFTA with the first series. Um, we also won a Kids Screen Award in New York, which has been really thrilling um, for our first series. This enabled stuff like this to happen. I think on a budget of two million, to launch something where you can then bring a brand out into the world and have toys out there that can ultimately pay to make the show. We couldn't keep making the show if we didn't uh, sort of uh, go in this direction. But um, the fact that there's also a parental love there to make that possible has been amazing for us. I hope we've given you a little bit of an insight over how the pipeline has helped us do that. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.